What I want to do this morning is, uh, is tell, tell a historical story about the relationship between capitalism and the family. Um, it's, it's, going to, it's a combination of economic history, a little bit of sociology, maybe a little bit of psychology, um, all kind of wrapped into, into a story. And a story in which I want to argue really fits the title of this week very well. Because the two themes, I, there's a lot of different themes you can pull out of the story I'm going to tell. But the themes that I think you can be looking for as, as I go through this morning is the way in which capitalism's effect on the family, the way capitalism transformed the family, is a story, one, about how capitalism made us, in fact, more moral, made the family a more moral institution. And secondly, how capitalism made the family a freer institution, or maybe more precisely, how capitalism enabled us to be freer to form different kinds of families uh, and kinds of families that enabled individuals within them to be more free. So I do think that this story weaves together our, our three themes from this week uh, fairly well. So, some opening thoughts. This is what I want to do, a history of the evolution of the family in which capitalism is the main source of desirable changes in the, in the direction of more freedom. And you might also think about, as I'm talking, other courses you've taken in college or elsewhere where people may have been made exactly the opposite argument, that in the, arguing that capitalism has, in fact, made family life awful. You, you often hear a sort of feminist line of argument that capitalism led to patriarchy, which has oppressed women, and so on. Um, you know, that's, that's another version of the factory poster that you know, Jeff had up on the first day. So be th as I go through, you might be thinking about those different kinds of narratives as well. And what I also want to point out is that there's an interesting dichotomy on the left and right about, about these issues. On the left today, people tend to think, on the political left, people tend to argue that what's good right now is that people do have more freedom to form the kinds of families they like. We've had all this cultural change in the last 50, 100, 200 years that have opened up the family in all kinds of different ways, and you can think of the same-sex marriage issue as being at sort of one end of that spectrum. But these are the same people who don't like capitalism. And what, part of what I want to argue today is that what made this possible is this. And it seems strange to me to celebrate the outcome, but to denigrate the cause. On the other side, though, we have the conservatives, who take just the opposite position, who at least claim, pay lip service to capitalism being good, but they're not so crazy about all this family freedom that's taken place in the last 50 or 100 years. And to them, I would say, well, wait a second. You guys love this. It's this that produces this. What gives, right? And instead, what I want to argue is, why not celebrate both? As classical liberals, as libertarians, why not celebrate both? Why not celebrate both all the good things that capitalism does and recognize that part of what it does is to create this kind of dynamic cultural change that opens up more opportunities for people to form the kinds of families they like, and more, I would argue more generally, opens up the culture in ways to do all kinds of things that, that people might wish to do that perhaps before we had the wealth, before we had the structures of production that come with capitalism, we simply couldn't do them. So part, another theme that I'm weaving this morning is this sort of why not celebrate both. And let me start with two opening observations. These are two very general observations about when we talk about the family. And this comes both from my sort of scholarly work, but also from teaching this topic to students for now 13 years maybe. Um, first of all, there's no such thing as, quote, the traditional family. Students all the time like to say, oh, well, what about the traditional family? To which I usually respond, which traditional family are you talking about, right? The family, like every other social institution, has changed and evolved throughout human history. Sometimes, you know, when you say the traditional family, people have that sort of 1950s TV show image of the, of the family, mom and dad and two kids, right, and dad, stay, dad works and mom stays at home and all that. That's, that's not traditional. That's the 1950s. There was centuries of human history before that when families were very, very different and changed and evolved. Single parenthood's nothing new, right? Parents died most of human history before kids got to be adults. Men died on the job or doing other things. Women died in childbirth. 
right? So single parent families aren't new. It's a, it, it, arguably, one could say, single parent families are in some sense more traditional than the sort of 1950s picture. I mean, I could go on with this, but I, I think that's enough to make my point. The second thing I want to make, say is watch out for that phrase, normal family, right? What, there's no such thing as a normal family, okay? Well, what do you mean by that? There's multiple meanings of normal when we talk about normal family. We could be talking about the functions that families perform, or we could be talking about the form that families take. For example, we could ask the question, well, what's the typical family look like? What's the average family? They have you know, 2.1 kids. What's their income? Right? We could describe them demographically in all kinds of ways. And we could do all this kind of statistical analysis about what families look like. And we could say, well, the average or typical family is this. right? And that's one notion of the word normal. But we also have another notion of that word normal, which has to do with how well families function. Right? Are families functional or are they dysfunctional? Right? Do they work? Do they provide for their members? That's a different notion of normal. That's more like, is the family healthy? And so when we think about families and think about that phrase, normal family, we need to separate those two. And, and one thing you might think about as you sort of read media accounts of family issues and so on is to watch how often people talk past each other when they use this phrase. Right? That, that, that no one, rarely do people define what, sort, what notion of normal that, that they're talking about. So with those couple things in mind, let's, let's do some history and let's tell a story here. Okay? What I want to contrast this morning is what we'll call the modern and the pre-modern family. And I always am hesitant doing these, this talk with a historian in the room because I always feel like I'm going to do uh, great violence to the details of history. But I'm telling a very broad sort of stylized story here. Um, and we can certainly talk about, you know, particular examples that fit it or don't. So let's talk first. I'm actually going to work this backwards. I want to define what we might mean by the modern family. Then I'm going to back up and talk about how the family used to be different and then what caused it to become what we think of as the modern family. So how might we define the modern family? I want to argue there's four pieces, four things that define the really 19th and 20th century and 21st century family. One of those is that marital choice, that, that people have marital choice, it's by consent, Right? The people who get married consent to be married. It's not arranged, say, by their parents. But it's also about emotional romantic attraction. This idea of marrying for love is relatively recent. Is a relatively recent development in human history, at least for most of the population. Really, until the last couple hundred years at most, people, for the most part, did not marry for love. It's a peculiarly modern phenomenon. And as we know, and still in many parts of the world today, they don't. And also, marriage by consent is f relatively recent too. That's older than marriage for love, right? Because notice, those are not the same things. You can consent to marry someone, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're marrying them because you love them, because you have an emotional romantic attraction to them. So part of what defines a modern family is that marital couples get together by consent and through ro romantic, uh, emotional, sexual attraction. Another piece is that the family is a private, insulated sphere. We tend to think of the family today, and certainly I think classical liberals like to think of the family, as this space away from the market, but also away from the state. It's a, pri a man's home is his castle. It's a private sphere in which we are separated. We have uh, 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 protection against the state, against the community perhaps, against uh, the marketplace. This is also a relatively recent phenomenon in, hu in human history. For most of human history, the family was a very public, porous institution that the community, the church, the state could all interfere with and manipulate and affect the family in all kinds of ways. Even that, the phrase, the nuclear family, right, sort of down to the bare nucleus. But it also suggests that there's a kind of shell, a protection around the family. That is part of what we think of as the modern family. Another part of the modern family is that uh, tr children are treated sentimentally and they're uniquely valued. Uh, a phrase that uh, the number of authors use to describe this is the, sh the sheltered childhood. That what children in the modern world, what children in modern families have, is a childhood in which kids are protected, again, from the outside world, where they're educated, where kids are loved. You know, I, I love to, if you watch The Simpsons, I love to invoke the Helen Lovejoy character. You know, what about the children? What about the children, right? Okay, and that the way we, the way we think about kids, right, and that as if, you know, children are uniquely valued. Nothing bad can ever happen to a child, 
right? Think, <coughs> think about how much of that sentence explains the strange things you see happening in the culture around you. Nothing bad can ever happen to a child. Right? That is that's very modern. For most of human history, children were not treated this way, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay? And finally, legal equality and, and now, more recently, more economic equality between the genders. In particular, women, ha women to, in, within the modern family have achieved legal equality and have uh, much more economic equality with men than they used to. And this is very transformative of the family as well, as you might imagine. One of the key things this does is it enables women to survive on their own without men. And this is crucial for how, for the kinds of choices that women can make today, both getting into marriage and a family and getting out of marriage and, and a family. So that's what we mean by the modern family. And what I want to argue is the modern family is a result of capitalism. That before we had capitalism, in particular before capitalism gave us both industrialization and higher degrees of wealth, this family didn't exist. Only after capitalism do we see this. And in fact, what I want to now look at is what we might call the pre-industrial, the pre-modern family. How did families differ from this historically? Right? And, and, and how might we tell the story of how we got this change? In the pre-industrial family, one of the key things to remember is that the family was the unit of economic production. It was not primarily a unit of consumption. In other words, we think of families today, those who have taken economics know, when we study the consumer, what are we really studying? We're studying households. And what are households? Not all of them, but most households are families. And we think about that today in terms of consumption. But for most of human history, families are really about production. That's where economic activity took place. The household was the firm. And members of the household contributed to the output that that firm produced, which was then sold on the market. Primarily, this was agricultural, but it didn't have to be. You could have small, uh, small craftspeople. And we have still with us today a remnant, a vestige of the time when the family was the unit of production. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know if we have, I, we must, if I can think, I didn't look carefully to see whether it's true that there's an example in the room today. You know what I'm talking about? Family farms. Well, we still have family farms, but, I, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a vestige in our, in our society, a, a sort of signal that at one time, what your family was, was what you did for a living. Well, people with last names that are a trade. Yes, last names that are a trade, like? The Smiths. The Smiths, what else? Carpenter. Carpenter. Archer, what is Archer? Good. Baker, Miller. Cooper, Miller, Tanner. Yes, excellent. Fletcher. Anyone know what a Fletcher does? <coughs> Makes arrows. Good. Yeah. Okay. All of these. Okay. All of these last names, right? Which are we now are, all, are both names and occupations. The reason people had those names historically was because that was their occupation. So who you were, who, who your family was, and what you did for a living were almost indistinguishable. And that's this idea of the family, family being a unit of production. Again, the household is the firm. This sort of separation that we have today between the two, um, not so separate back, back in the day. The other piece of this puzzle, too, is that the family was also a political unit, particularly among the, better, the upper classes. Right? We, we can think of all the Shakespeare plays. We can think of going back into Greek tragedy. All, all these sorts of things where family politics, right? where, 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 where decisions about family were also political decisions. And normally, this was among the, the upper class, right? That among the upper class, who you married uh, mattered, okay? Um, and, and even among the poor, though, marrying someone was a way to form networks of social support. Um, how many of you have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Just raise your hands. Oh, there's hope for the future, thank God. <laughs> okay? Remember the scene, the wedding scene, right? Where, with, right, where, where, uh, where Herbert marries Princess Luki, okay? Do you remember, there's several things about that scene to illustrate these points, right? First of all, why does the king want them to marry? Tracks Huge tracts of land, okay? Right? He doesn't, does, does he love her? No, that's the whole, you know, what generates that whole scene is that he doesn't love her. But he has to marry her because he's got huge tracts of land and he lives in a castle on a swamp and so on. Okay, so what else happens? Well, 
so in comes Lancelot, right? Stabs everybody. There's people bleeding all over the place. My daughter thought this was the funniest scene ever. Okay? <laughs> what does the king say after all this mayhem? First of all, he refers to the marriage by an interesting word. He, he misspeaks. He refers to, to the merger, a uh, marriage of these, right? Remember? Okay. And then what does he say after, you know, the guests are all upset about all this blood and havoc that's been wreaked, right? What is, remember what the king says? Who knows? So you got to, look, if you're really a Monty Python geek, you would know these things. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. Exactly. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. On with the wedding. Right? It's like, and to us, that seems, that's funny to us, right? But if you view marriage and family as these enormous acts of, of, of politics and of economic mergers, right? That, that line isn't that funny, right? I mean, it's, it, there's truth to that line. I once was at a conference with an economic historian who said, Monty Python and the Holy Grail is the most realistic portrayal of the Middle Ages ever filmed. Okay? And he was referring specifically to the Black Plague, bring out your dead scene. Okay? But I think there's, other, there's, there's a great deal of truth. The Pythons actually did study you know, European history when they, were making, when they were making the film. So that scene illustrates, I think, a bunch of these, of these ideas. So how is all this pre-modern? Well, for one thing, marriages, for most of human history, were arranged. Children did not have a great deal of choice in who they married. Parents arranged marriages on the basis of economic compatibility or, again, if you had enough power, on the basis of what made sense politically. The notion of marrying who you wish to marry uh, was, was just not really, in, uh, not really possible for, for most people. Again, it was about... Uh, and even where kids could consent, it was often not about love, right? People didn't marry for love. That was considered silly and frivolous. When you're living on the margins of survival, marrying someone who, who can produce with you, who can help work the farm or the trade or whatever it is, was far more important than something you loved. That's silly, right? And one way that author Stephanie Kuntz makes this wonderful distinction between married couples as yoke mates rather than soul mates. Right? That what married couples were, were people who, could, who complemented each other in production. Right? That who could work together, who could farm together, who could run a small, what, you know, business, a small craft uh, uh, organization together, right? rather than people who, who loved each other. And we think about it today, right? When you think about who, who you're romantically att uh, attracted to today, it tends to be people who you share not production complementarities with, but consumption complementarities. That is, we marry people who we like to do stuff with. We like to go to the same restaurants, we both like to ski, we both like to travel, whatever it might be, right? It's about, today, it's about complementarities in our consumption. But for most of human history, it was about could we produce together, right? And that's a very, that's a radical change in, in, the, nature, in the nature of marriage, right? Again, for most of human history, women were effectively chattel. Women had, did not have the same rights as men. Within, within, uh, within a marriage, uh, women were co almost completely subject to their husband's whim. Uh, even as late, it isn't until the mid to late 19th century that we see the end of what were called coverture laws. And coverture laws essentially said that married women were covered by their husbands legally and economically. If you were a married woman, you couldn't sign a contract. You couldn't own property, right? Because your identity was subsumed into that of your husband. And it really isn't until over the course of the 19th century, notice, after the advent of capitalism, that we begin to see those laws, those laws go away. There's one story sometimes told or, or, or example given about this where um, a husband would be more likely to call someone to treat his sick cow than his sick wife. Okay, and why would that be? Well, look, the cow is really important. You can always get another wife. Mm -hmm. And if you think in terms of the family as a unit of production, you know, which one of those is the more valuable asset to production? Might be the cow. Right? And one of the interesting things here, and this is a theme I'll come back to, is that in this world, where the family is a unit of production, families become subject to these very sort of narrow acts of economic calculation, where, where fathers, husbands as sort of the, the, the CEO, right, 
look at both their wives and their children as productive assets into the farm or into the, into the craft and think about them in the way we would think about allocating resources. And that, I think, is, a, is an interesting thing to, to, to consider. And which leads to the next point, children were economic assets. For most of human history, again, um, kids, the most valuable thing children did was to contribute to production as early as they could. And as a result, we tended to see people having large family sizes. Now, part of that was you had a, this was a time of very high infant mortality rates, number one, um, and not very effective uh, uh, methods of contraception uh, other than abstinence, right? And so between the two of those, you had a world in which women, many women, were sort of constantly pregnant or nursing, right? Not all of those kids would live to adulthood. In fact, it was not unusual to find families with, say, two boys named John because what parents would do would, would name two or even three of their kids the same first name because they knew odds were only one of them would survive to adulthood. All right? That's not a very pleasant world to live in, especially if you're a woman, by the way, right? But large family size, notice here that the large family size is actually quite a rational decision, right? They need the labor, right? It's, and it's really fun to make, too. Okay? <laughs> Much more fun than hiring someone. All right? Do it yourself. Okay, but who's bearing the burden of this? Right, are, are women again? As I pointed out earlier, death during death during pregnancy or childbirth was also uh, a very common occurrence. All you need to keep in mind was the state of so-called medicine at the time, and you can you can see what's happening. Uh, but more more interesting in many ways were the way in which parents treated their children. Right, this idea we have today of the again of the sort of sentimental childhood of of, of how how parents think of, you know what about the children. Parents were much, what we would say today is that parents were much more callous towards their children back then. Some people argue, well, you know, it's not surprising. They, they, would, they couldn't invest emotionally in their kids because the odds of those kids dying was just so high that you'd be, you know, you'd be constantly in grief over your kids. And there's a lot of debate among historians about that point. I think there's some truth to it. And there is some historical evidence to suggest that parents didn't quite grieve over their children who died at a young age the same way we do today. But there's other things that were happening at the time, too. Among, among upper classes, for example, parents would uh, 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 give their children out to other people to nurse, to so-called wet nurses, right? Because they, mothers literally often you know, were busy doing things, couldn't afford the time. Their time was more valuable doing other things. They sort of farm their, you know, outsource their kids to, to other people, other women to nurse. And you can imagine what life would be like if you were a poor woman who was a wet nurse and you spent all your time nursing other people's children, okay? Not a great life, number one, but number two, the way these children were treated by wet nurses was absolutely awful, okay? To the point where there's stories about kids where, where there's so many kids that these wet nurses were trying to take care of, they just couldn't. Remember, there were no play pens, you know, there were no ways to restrain kids at the time. So one, one thing some of them would do would bundle them up tightly, swaddle them up in, 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 in a wrap and hang them on a hook. I'm, 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 I'm completely serious. Okay? Do you know what one common way for kids to die was back then? From being burned. Why? Because on cold days, they would be, infants would be left near the fire to stay warm. Right? And all you needed was one gust of wind or something to blow an ember. Right? In my head, I just said baby flambe, but that wouldn't be very nice, would it? Okay? But, you'd, you'd, but kids frequently got, were killed through, you know, in, in these sorts of ways. And again, what, what's the, you know, we, to us, this is horrible, right? We, you know, there'd be lawsuits, right? <laughs> okay? But in, a world, in, a, in this world, there were limited options. And you couldn't afford, in many ways, to invest as, as emotionally in, um, in your kids. And then finally... Uh, family life was was porous to the to the uh, to the public. Okay, the the, um, the family was a tool, a cog in the community's machinery, and the and the and the community intervened in the family in a whole bunch of different ways. And again, the church, the state, the community were all involved in these decisions about marriage, uh, things like adoption, divorce, sexuality. Just to give you a few examples, okay? Uh, obviously, the biggest one was marital choice. People couldn't marry who they wanted. All of these folks often had a stake in who you married and an influence over it. Um, the, the Catholic Church had very strict rules about who you could marry, um, and there were all these debates about what degree of cousin you could marry and, the, and, and all these limits on, on how closely you could marry uh, within your family. 
Um, there's interesting stories behind that as well. Uh, you, could, you couldn't marry, uh, within, for example, within Judaism, if, you, um, if, if, uh, if, a man, if a married man died, it was expected that his widow would marry the man's brother, if he had one, as a way of keeping the property in the family. Uh, the church prohibited that practice, right, and prevented people from doing, from doing that. Um, the church, for a long period of time, prohibited adoption. Right? So if you were childless, you were stuck. You, could, you couldn't adopt. Right? Um, and obviously, prohibitions on, on uh, sexual behavior, adultery, especially female adultery. About the worst thing a woman could do would be to, to engage in an adulterous relationship because that made it difficult to determine parentage if she got pregnant and had a kid. And parentage and lineage was so crucial for economic and political reasons. Obviously, prohibitions on divorce. Um, and, 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 well, let's just call prohibitions or penalties for non-procreative sexual activity, which were often enforced very strictly as well. So all these sorts of ways, the church, the state, the community intervened uh, with, within family. And the community often enforced these norms. If you, your neighbors would spy on you, if people saw you doing things you weren't supposed to be doing, you might be subject to public protest and public uh, uh, embarrassment in all kinds of different ways. Bottom line here is, for most of human history, family life was just flat out awful. Okay? Um, actually, I have one more, one more slide in there. And flat out awful, and particularly for women, and to some degree for, for children. So what changed all this? What I want to argue is it was the advent of capitalism that was, again, not the only force, but a, a significant force in changing all this. And capitalism did this in two ways. First, through industrialization and the advent of wage labor. We'll talk about that in a second. And secondly, through the higher incomes that capitalism brought due to economic growth. These two things together enabled a transformation of the family from this sort of pre-modern family into the modern family as we, as we know it today. All right? So what does industrialization do? Well, what industrialization does is that for the first time really in human history, a significant number of people work outside the home. It separates what we call market and household production. The idea of going to work, right, which we now, again, sort of take for granted unless you telecommute, okay, you go to work, right, this capitalism, the factory system, was really the first place that made that possible. It got people out of the house and... It separated economic survival from the institution of the family. You earned your living outside the family. And this, as, as I'll argue in a bit, is, is, uh, is particularly important. One of the things that it did is that industrialization, again, contrary to the demotivator poster, right, what, what, what capitalism did, what industrialization did, was to drive up people's wages and make working in the factories a preferred source of income to people in agriculture. Once the factory system got up and going, people flocked from the farms to the cities, not because people put a gun to their head, but because the op they recognized that the opportunities in the city, in the factories under capitalism, were greater for them and their families than they were scraping out a living on the farm. The question came up yesterday about why we romanticize uh, the, the past. And I think that's a really, really terrific question and, and hopefully one you're thinking about again as we have this conversation this morning. But this is, this is one of the great examples of that, right? We have this romantic view of pre-industrial farm life, right? Sort of, you know, peacefully tending our crops and the children frolicking in the fields, right? You know. Uh-uh. It sucked. <laughs> right? Again, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There's some lovely dirt over here. Right? That, that sort of trying to scrape a living off the land is no fun. 14 hours a day out in the sun is not fun. Being in a factory is at least no worse and possibly better, particularly when the pay is higher and more certain. You're not subject to you know, weather and all these, all these sorts of things. And we see the same thing happening, by the way, across the, the third world today. We see people flocking to the factories, right, lining up to be exploited, I like to call it, all right. People flocking to the factories because they recognize, particularly women, there was a terrific article in the New York Times earlier or last week on this in Bangladesh, right, about how women are, are 
thrilled to be working in factories and have those opportunities. Yeah, it's hard work, it's long hours, but it's much better than their other alternatives. And this is what happened early in, in the early years of capitalism as well. As a result of this, uh, as a result of, 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 of this process of industrialization and, and, and as a result of the, the higher incomes, one of the things that, that we see happen is that uh, family size begins to shrink. Where kids were once necessary to work the farm or work our, our small crafts, um, now we don't, need the in, we don't need children as economic assets as much. Early on in the Industrial Revolution, of course, kids worked in the factories. Parents needed that income. But as capitalism drove up the wages, as, as the competition among firms bid up the wages of labor, those higher wages eventually meant that children were no longer needed in the factories. To, the income of children were no longer needed to support family. And, and by the way, women worked in those factories too, right? And eventually even married women came back to the home. And so what we see happen by, say, the late 19th century is the disappearance of child labor and the disappearance of uh, or women returning, women going to the home and out of the factories. Just a quick note, by the way, if you're ever in a debate with someone about this, these, these child labor issues, the evidence is pretty clear that child labor was on its way out, clearly on its way out, well before the laws were passed ending it. Like so many other things, we tend to pass draconian laws to stop a practice when that practice has become relatively rare and therefore offends us the most. Right? Smoking rates went way, way down before we basically said the only place you could smoke is a ditch out and back of them, right? You know. Okay. That's a, and and we'll, I think, I suspect we may see this with other kinds of behavior. There's other examples of this too, right? But child, there, there's pretty good, very good economic historical evidence on this question. And uh, in, in the ways in which, if you look at when the child labor laws were passed and what the rates of child labor were, that you see it disappearing well before the laws, the laws were passed. So I think that's an important point to, to keep in mind here. Um, so kids switch from being directly producing assets to being investments. You guys sit around for the first 22 years of your life producing absolutely nothing. And thank God for that too, right? And what we do is we invest in you So as a society. We pay for your education, both literally parents out of their pockets, but also sort of in the way that we devote resources, and we invest in you. We don't need your production until you're already into your 20s, at which point you're doing it for yourself, not for the family. And as kids become, as kids switch from assets to investments in this way, obviously from the parents' point of view, they become more expensive and parents have fewer of them. Right? It's not because there was a major revolution in contraception that parents started having fewer kids. It's that parents wanted fewer kids and said, we need to find better ways of stopping right? that, you know, other than abstinence, that prevent us from, from having kids. Contraceptive technology largely trailed these events as, as the demand for contraception increased as parents said, we don't want all these kids. It's, we, we don't need them. We don't want them. It's too, it's, too, it's too much. And childhood now becomes the sheltered childhood we know. You can see how this process would develop as we start educating children. We protect them from the world of the market. We don't, they don't work. Right? We, we educate them, we, uh, and we slowly come to where I think we are today, where we've taken this to quite the extreme. So family size begins to shrink, even as infant mortality rates begin to drop. So kids are less likely to die in childhood, yet family size is shrinking. Right? So clearly, a conscious decision here by parents to think differently about children and about how many they had and how, and how, they, how they treated them. Let me talk a little bit about changes in marriage. I'm watching my time here because this always takes longer than I expected. Well, all right. With families having more wealth, it's who you marry is no longer quite the important, momentous economic decision. And by the way, with the advent of democracy, it's not quite the same political decision you had that it was before. And so what happens here is that these other forces kind of get pushed back. The state, the community, the church, even parents have less of a role. Marriage becomes a matter of choice, and then later affection, not a matter of, of economics. And again, consumption complementarities matter more than production. And we get what we now think of as the nuclear, as the nuclear family. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about this in the Victorian era, but I'm actually going to skip that because I'm w watching my time here. So we're up to kind of the late 19th century here. And by the early 20th century, one of the things that begin to begins to happen is that those women who had kind of 
gone home out of the factories in the 19th century, now begin to creep back into the labor force. But this time, not working in the factories, you know, at the machines or the mills or whatever, but in these in clerical and service jobs. As in the early 20th century, these sorts of jobs become more common. Also, we're educating all these kids. What does that mean we need? Teachers, teachers right? We need teachers. School teacher, very common job for women early in the 20th century. Um, and higher incomes at the time, again, mean more education for boys and girls. And with that addition to education, both boys and girls become more valuable in the labor market. And we begin to see, uh, we begin to see women entering in ways that they hadn't before. And really by the early 20th century, we now have more or less what is the modern family. And where did this come from? This came from the forces unleashed by capitalism a century earlier. Hot, through industrialization, through higher incomes, these two things together make all this possible. So I want to continue the story, though, into the 20th century, and we're, I'm going to do this, again, fairly quickly, because I think there's two really important events in the 20th century that, that, that speak to these changes. The most important demographic, economic demographic event of the 20th century is the rise in female labor force participation. The number of women working for pay in the marketplace. Uh, and, and you can't talk about the 20th century, you can't talk about the family in the 20th century without talking about this. The myth, though, is that this didn't really happen until after the 1960s. We had the women's movement in the 1960s. That liberated women, and all of a sudden these women you know, ran into the job market, got their jobs, and destroyed the family, right? You've, you know, you've heard this story before. Well, it's a, it's a myth. It's a myth on both ends. It didn't destroy the family, but I actually want to focus on the other end. In fact, if anything, it's the other way around. If anything, it was the fact that women were slowly but surely entering the labor force in increasing numbers over the 20th century that brought the women's movement on. Why? Because women were, were in the labor market, were beginning to become equal to men in a number of di different ways, or at least pushing at it, and realized how many barriers there still were in the way, and realized they could work and have kids and all these sorts of things. And so the sort of organized women's movement of that sort of begins in the 50s and really flowers in the 60s and 70s, is if anything more a result of those economic changes than a cause. So I think that, and that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. And if anything, the thing that's more important than any of that is the little magic round thing, the pill. Right? The economic impact of the birth control pill is uh, enormous. There was a great series in Time Magazine, that's a sense you don't hear me say very often, um, a couple months ago on the, on, the, on the 50th anniversary of the pill, which this, this year, 1960, was when it became first available, that was really, really good at looking at some of the, the ways in which the pill matters and has, has changed things. Um, the one thing we have seen since the 60s, though, is the rise of working moms with very, very young kids. You know, women who literally have children are back at work within a couple months, and, and women who are working full-time with kids under five um, that, that number has jumped a lot since the 60s. And, and one reason for that, I would argue, is again, we've continued to create wealth and made it possible for women and for families to purchase daycare in ways that they, that they hadn't before. So what led to women, more women working? Bottom line, higher wages drew them out of the home. right? And this came from a couple of different places, one of which is that, that women had more education. Women were more likely to finish high school than college. That raised the value of their human capital. It made them more valuable as workers. But just as importantly, we saw a higher demand for labor resulting from economic growth that raised the value of that human capital. We, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, we needed labor. Okay? And, and women, there was only so many men to go around, and women were, were, were drawn into the workforce by the possibility of, of, those, of those higher wages. There is one other element to this process, though, that's worth mentioning. Because if women are going to the labor force, what's not happening? Yeah, something's got to get done in the home, right? If all these women are working all the time, why aren't there piles of trash and you know, babies lying by the fireplace right, and all this kind of stuff in the home? One answer is that technological advances reduce the time necessary to clean a house, right? The, the invention of the vacuum cleaner, of the dishwasher, the microwave oven. Where would we be without the microwave? Okay, all these sorts of things reduce the time necessary for women and men, but mostly women, to engage in household production. Um, there's a great, if you ever get a chance to watch it or rent it, there's a wonderful show a number of years ago on, on PBS, it was actually produced in Britain, called 1900 House, where a, a British family lived in a house outfitted as if it were 1900 with 1900 technology, and you can really see this point. 
One of the problems in in, for that family in 1900 was it took about three days to do the family's laundry. And that often meant that the two girls had to stay home from school one day a week to help do the laundry before you had the technological stuff to do it. Think about the implications of that uh, for, for all, a whole bunch of things. Um, the other thing here is that economic growth provides market substitutes for time. Let me give you an example. I'm going to pick on my colleague David Hart. Uh, David, when you were young, how often did you go out to dinner with your family? Once a month. Once a month. That's what I'm, those of us who grew up, Tawny? When I was younger? Yeah, when you were... The, make, what? About twice. Twice a month? Yeah. yeah. I bet if I asked you guys how often you, go, you either go out to dinner with your family or buy your, di bought your dinner sort of as teenagers in high school, the answer would be something more like a couple, three times a week, right? Yeah. Yeah, may, may, maybe more. All right? Think about the rise of daycare. Think about how many people pay to have their lawns mowed. Think about the rise of the pedicure. What, you can't do that yourself? I have this conversation frequently in my house. Huh? No, we can pay someone else to do it, right? I don't have the, uh, you know, I can afford to pay someone else to do it. It takes too much time. They do a better job. All these sorts of things, right? Economic growth provides market substitutes for things that would be time-intensive investments, such as uh, th these things in the household. The result of this is enormous impact on the family in the 20th century. Women are freer to create and leave marriages, thanks to this greater wealth and the reduction in specialization by gender. Sorry guys, women don't need you anymore. Except maybe if they want to have kids. Right? Historically, men and women needed each other, right? Men needed kids, they needed a woman for that. Women needed economic support, that's where men came in. That specialization is gone, for the, almost completely. And so women don't need men in the same way. They're freer to make these different kinds of decisions than they, than they were before. Fewer kids, more wealth means childcare is less time consuming and more easily purchased on the market. So we see parents substituting away from their own time into paid childcare or often drawing on family and friends as well. Um, and the family shifts from primarily an economic institution to a psychological, emotional one. Families are about love now. They weren't about love, at least they're supposed to be. They weren't about love for most of human history. And children, of course, become increasingly, increasingly precious. And, and again, all, and all the things that that brings with it. Um, I've got about 10 minutes left. I think I can do this. OK, I've got two more, two more big slides. Um, I just want to say a couple things about divorce, because one of the reactions people often have is, OK, so you're telling me there's more divorce, and that, that's a good thing, because it's, it's been, for the most part, good for women. Yes, I, I, that is the argument. And the response is, but what about the children? Okay. And that's a fair response. I just want to say a couple things about divorce um, to get you thinking, and these are things you can talk about in your breakout groups. Um, clearly, one effect of the rise of, of capitalism on the, these change in the family is higher divorce rates. One way to think about this is that preferences have changed. The bar for being happy in a marriage, especially for women, is much higher. I'm not joking when I say, Historically, for many women, the question was, am I still alive? Yes, good marriage. Okay? That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not too much. All right? Today, that's not the minimal standard. You're not expected to just be alive or survive or, or whatever. You're expected to be happy. And as that threshold for happiness has risen, it's more easy for women and for men right, to be disappointed and to want out. So one reason we see higher divorce rates, is that marriage is about love in ways it didn't used to be. At the same time, economists, we like to talk about preferences and constraints. The constraints have changed, right? Unha you could have been just as unhappy as a woman, let's say, 200 years ago, but you'd be unable to leave because you were constrained by your own income, by other opportunities in the marketplace. But now, for a given level of unhappiness, it's easier for women, again, or men, to leave a marriage. And so we see more divorce. The, I, I want to argue that this is a good thing. That the possibility of easier divorce has saved a number of women from being stuck in really bad, just awful marriages. That doesn't mean it doesn't come with costs, but it is a good thing. And it's made them, I think, in a substantive way, more free. So we have to think in terms of the costs and benefits. It's clearly a win for women, although no-fault divorce has some serious issues with it that we can talk about if you want. I just don't have the time to go into that. Um, is divorce good for kids? The evidence seems pretty clear that it's not, it's, it's not a disaster for kids, but it's not 
necessarily good for them either. It, de it depends is really the answer. One of the things, by the way, it depends on is the degree of conflict between the divorcing couple. Right? Kids are better off in a civil, peaceful divorce than they are in a high conflict marriage. It's the conflict that's the problem, not so much the divorce or the marriage. But the, again, the evidence is clear that a cooperative divorce is better than a tension-filled marriage. Even if divorce hurts kids, though, adults matter too. You can't think in terms of corner solutions here, where it's only the kids that matter. It may be that kids suffer a little bit from divorce, but it also may be that divorce is really good for one or the other of the parents. The parents matter too. How we want to weigh those off is an interesting question. But the parents' freedom to make those decisions matters too. It can't all be about the kids. Otherwise, we're in a, in a, in a place I think that's really problematic. The, other, the last thing I want to talk about is the, the question of same-sex marriage. Okay? And, and we can certainly talk about the policy end of this in the Q&A if you want, but that's not what I'm interested in here. Okay? What I'm interested in here is talking about how this phenomenon is the kind of the logical culmination of this evolutionary process that capitalism started. And I want to argue that in some sense capitalism created, created the whole idea of gay and lesbian identity. And if you think I'm crazy, for, if this is some crazy libertarian thing, this argument is borrowed from a very famous historian of the family who's about as far to the left uh, as you, well, that's maybe an overstatement, but pretty far to the left. Uh, but he recognized correctly this, this process. How did it do this? Well, one of the things is that wage labor, industrialization and wage labor, eliminated the economic need for a family. Individuals could survive economically outside the family in a way they never could earlier in human history. The other thing capitalism did was to produce these cities, these anonymous urban centers, where people could go and just be part of a crowd and escape from the prying eyes of the community, of the church, of, of, of other family members. You could be who you wanted to be in those places because it offered you anonymity. Those two things are, are elements produced by the wealth and by the industrialization of capitalism. So why are we seeing this sort of interest in same-sex marriage now? What, what's, what's kind of driving this? And what I'd argue is, is one of it, one aspect of this is there is this long tradition both in classical liberalism and still, though less so perhaps in modern liberalism, a kind of tolerance, at least on the social side, for anything that's peaceful. I think your generation and the survey data show this, are, you're large, much more sympathetic to the same-sex marriage question than, previous, than older folks are. And I think one reason is, is that you, you guys have a difficulty seeing exactly what the harm is, who's being harmed by this. Uh, by, by this. And, and I think that's part of this broad liberal tradition. But more importantly, I think, is that wealth and technology have separated sex, marriage, and reproduction for heterosexuals, right? You can have sex and not have a baby. You can have sex and not be married. You can be married and not have a baby, married and not have sex. You can have a baby. Not, you, you, know, you can do this in any combination in almost any order you want, okay? And once you get there, it's, you can understand why same-sex couples might say, well, wait a second, if that's the case, why are we different? Right? We, we, you know, all we are is part of this story too, where we do these things where sex, marriage, and reproduction are all matters of choice and how we organize them and the order we do them. Us too, right? We're just like an unmarried heterose or un uh, heterosexual couple who doesn't want to have kids. We're just like them, right? And as capitalism transformed marriage from being an economic and reproductive, institution to being emotion-based and affectionate, you can also understand why same-sex couples are saying, well, wait a second. Why are we any different? We love each other. We're, well, there's plenty of heterosexual couples who don't want to have kids. We can't, or at least ourselves, have kids. Right? Why are we any different? Why, isn't the, why shouldn't we be allowed into this institution of marriage, given all the ways that marriage has changed over the last 200 years? And if you add all this up, it does seem like this is the next logical step. And this is a more normative claim on my part. But the, the non-normative claim is that families and marriage have always evolved in these sorts of ways. And the sort of leap from the is to the ought here is, is to ask whether this isn't the case, whether this just isn't the next step. One way, one way to think about this is that 
as the functions that families perform have changed over history, the forms that families take have changed in response. And as those functions have sort of coalesced around the emotional and the affectionate and moved away from the economic and the political, families have, have people have found more freedom, more ver a greater variety of ways to form families than they used to because a larger range of family structures are able to perform what the functions of families are expected to be today. And in that sense, the demand for same-sex marriage can be seen as evolutionary, not revolutionary. The real revolution happened when families became about emotion and affection. When families became about love, when capitalism made that possible, that was the revolutionary step in the history of the family. What we're seeing now, I would argue, is sort of one more step along that path. Okay. Let me leave you with a few questions to think about in your breakout groups. And you can talk about whatever you want, but here's some things that, that you, might, you might want to consider. <coughs> Should the state have any role in marriage at all? If the state does have a role, or is going to continue to have a role for the foreseeable future, is there a libertarian case for legalizing same-sex marriage? Notice a libertarian case, right? a classical liberal case. And if so, where's our lawyers? Where would you find the constitutional argument? This is my favorite. How might libertarians deal with the very tricky question of children's rights? And by the way, people say, well, you know, if you, you hear this, well, libertarians have no way of dealing with children's rights. Blah, blah, blah. To which my response is, neither does any other political philosophy. Right? It's the toughest question, I think in many ways, in, in political philosophy, which is how do, you, how do you deal with the question of kids? Right? They're human, but they're not human. Right? <laughs> it's true. Right? They're human, but they're not consenting adults. Right? And so you're, you're, any political theory has to take account of that and figure out a way to deal with it. And one question, one way I like to think of this from a classical liberal perspective is whether talking in terms of children's rights doesn't make matters more difficult, whether the real question here is about parental rights. And so that's something for you to think about. And again, if anyone, if you know the constitutional law, feel free to include that in your discussion. As I said, you can, you can take the discussion wherever you want to go. I do want to leave you, though, with one thought. One of the criticisms that people make, again, about capitalism is that it turns everything into what often is called instrumental rationality or cold economic calculation, that capitalism turns us into these heartless automatons who only think about what's narrowly uh, economically beneficial. If you've been paying attention the last 55 minutes, hopefully what you've seen is that the story of capitalism's effect on the family is exactly the opposite. One of the most important contributions capitalism has made is to humanize family relationships. In fact, it's to take family relationships out of the realm of the calculative and the instrumentally rational. For most of human history, the family was just another place we you know, figured out how to use things most efficiently right, and sort of allocated resources from the top down where people had limited choice and freedom about what to do. Right? They were pawns of the head of the household. Capitalism change that. Capitalism turned the family into an emotional and affection-based uh, uh, unit. It humanized the family. That's an enormous accomplishment. And I'm going to recommend one book to you. I don't think I put it in my, in, my, uh, in my readings for this. An absolutely wonderful book that came out in 2006 is a book called The Bourgeois Virtues by Deirdre McCloskey, who's an economic historian and now sort of writes on all kinds of different things. And what she argues in that book is that capitalism created virtue created virtues, is a source of virtue in ways that we often don't recognize. And I think this story fits right into that. If you, it's, a bit, it's a pretty hefty book, but it's a fun read. Even the first 54 pages, the first chapter of that book, is, a, is worth reading to see this point. And so for me, the story of the evolution of the family is a perfect example of the ways in which capitalism has made us more moral and more free. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, breakout groups.